everyone, Sean Frangella here with a new tutorial series on how to create, light, animate, render, and composite a 3D extruded logo in Cinema 4D Lite inside of After Effects. So if you're new to using the built-in version of Cinema 4D in After Effects, this will be a great starting off point where we'll go over a lot of tips with getting it built out, as well as if you're using the full version of Cinema 4D, you can also work with it that way and do your compositing in After Effects. And if you happen to see a tutorial I did a couple years ago about this process, this is an updated version of that where we're dealing with now the most current software as of this recording, which is After Effects CC 2015 and Cinema 4D Lite R16 or the full version R17, Cineware 3.0. So we're going over everything as current as possible because some things have changed in the software since that first recording. And I've learned a lot since then, so I want to put together some newer, quick best practices. So here we are in After Effects with the extruded logo. And in this part of the series, we'll go over taking the artwork from Illustrator and creating our extrusions and getting in an Illustrator and then do all the lighting, rendering, and animation in the next parts. And how this is being built out in Cinema 4D Lite or the full version is here we have our geometry with this Denver Broncos logo fully built out because Super Bowl 50 just happened. So we'll go with the Broncos logo since they just won. Even if you're not into Peyton Manning's Budweiser and Papa John chilling ass, you can still follow along and learn about creating this. So I'm going to close this down and let's start from scratch in After Effects. I'll just close everything. So here we are, new project in After Effects. And to launch Cinema 4D Lite within After Effects, what we want to do is go to File, New, Max on Cinema 4D File. And again, if you're in the full version, you could just start in Cinema 4D and then just bring the C4D file in. So we'll do that. It's going to open up our save window. So we'll make sure we save this. I'll just call this Logo 2. It's going to pop open Cinema 4D Lite R16, which in this case is the current version. And here we are. The first thing I'm going to want to do is set up my project settings and dimensions, which I can do right here with my render settings. And I can set that to 1920 by 1080 and lock that ratio just so I know when I get this back in After Effects, it's going to be at HD resolution. And now I have this logo in Illustrator, which again, in this case is the Broncos logo. And it's important that it's vector artwork. So we have our lines, points and curves that we can import into Cinema 4D and the colors don't matter. All we're actually going to be bringing in is this vector data. But if we just bring it in as a basic Illustrator SVG or EPS file, nothing's going to show. One step we need to do first is do file save as, and I'll save this as a copy and click save. And we need to save this down to Illustrator version eight here at the bottom. Really important. Otherwise it's not going to show up and I'll go to okay. Now back in C4D, we're going to go to file merge over here in our object manager, locate that file click open and it's going to ask us if we want to connect splines or group splines if we're doing that. And we don't want to connect splines. If we did that, it's just going to bring it in as this one object and that's no good because we want it separated. So what we want to do is do file merge, uncheck connect. In this case, we don't need to group, but it might still group some things anyway. That's fine. I'm going to go to okay. And it's going to bring in my logo inside this group of nulls. And again, that's no big deal. And it's going to bring it in a little off. It usually again, it brings it in somewhere out in space. And what I want to do with this container first is go to coordinates and make sure I zero all of these out to set it in the center of my scene. You might want to start working, but this will be really important later when we're trying to do things exactly mathematical and have it line up correctly and more precise. Now, if we want to take a look at what we're rendering, if we do alt R, or option R, we notice we don't see anything because this is just the vector data as opposed to if we had basic shapes up here like a cube or any other objects where it's polygonal data, we need to add some sort of extrusion or do something with this vector data to give it some geometry. So before we get to extruding this and creating our geometry, one quick thing I want to do is pull all these paths out of my null groups by just grabbing all of them and making sure that we're dragging to the bottom and getting out of those nulls and we'll just delete those. And we can see that these are separated, which is good if I click through and I want to quickly name these because once we start extruding them and doing some tricks to separate those, we'll want to know what they are. So I'll just quickly go through and name these based on what they are. 
And so there we have our main shape. So our outer one right here is this outer main piece, which I'll just put at the bottom again, just for my organizational purposes to know where everything is. And that's gonna kind of be our baseline and we'll extrude everything out in steps so we get that nice chiseled look. Now, rather than doing this piece by piece or group by group, I'm gonna grab an extrude object and drop that into my scene and then plug all of these in. And it's only gonna do whatever's on top. And we wanna do these separately, but stay with me, there's this specific trick to make this a lot easier. So what we're gonna do is grab our extrude and this is the settings that is actually controlling our extrusion, but it's only gonna do the top one. So what we wanna do is go down to our attributes and check hierarchical, and that's gonna do everything that's within there. So if we start to move around and pull this stuff out, we can see it's extruding that, but we don't wanna do that yet. We want it to stay this whole shape for now and then use some quick shortcuts to separate it in a second. So I'm gonna to go to my extrude object, and if I go to object, we can see our movement is how much we're extruding it in Z, either front or back. So just as a baseline, I'm gonna set that at 60, and that'll give us a nice chunk. And now I wanna to go to caps and add some beveling to this, because if we press Alt-R now, we have some geometry, but our lines are very sharp, and that's not realistic when we're not gonna catch a lot of light. So what we wanna do is add some caps to this on the front and the back. So if we go to Start and change this from Cap to Fillet Cap and Fillet Cap, you can see it bevels that out and gives this kind of this chiseled look and it pushes that out from the main vector data. And if we wanna see what we're doing with our geometry and what we're adding, we can go to display garage shading lines or press N and then B with this little fly up menu. And there we can see all of our geometry data that we're adding. So we can see we have one additional step that we're adding with a radius of five. So if we wanted this to be a little smoother and smaller, we could do something like two steps and two radius on both. And then we'll get a nice little specular highlight. Now, one thing to note is it's taking this main vector object, if we turn our extrude on and off, and extruding it outwards. If we wanted to contain it within it, which can be really important with logos, we can go down here and check this constraint checkbox, and that's gonna make sure it pulls inward so we're not adding some extra chunkiness to this logo. Now, if we look at this, it's just this one flat piece, and that's not really useful, but this one little trick that is really gonna speed this process up is if we have all these objects in this one extrude, and under object, again, make sure we're checking hierarchical, otherwise it's not gonna work. Then if we press the letter C, or our make editable button, it's gonna put that in a null, and if we pop that open, it's separated them each into their own extrude object, inherited that name that we set up, so that's why it's really important to name them. And now we could look at our top view and just move these out and adjust as we want. Now that we have these separated, we can select different ones or select multiple ones by shift and clicking multiple options like our inner shape and our main and make them more extruded and offset them. But let's do this a little better. Let's get really precise. Since we are starting with 60 for the first one, rather than just mess around with the movement and try to make it look right, we can use some quick little math to make this exact and save ourselves some time with trying to tweak it too much. So if I grab a set of these, we can change multiple objects at one time. So I'll just add 10 to this, so 70 would add 10. And then again, rather than just grabbing it and moving it back, we can, with all them selected, go to coordinate. And there are different X, Y positions. So we'll get this little multiple, but Z is all the same because they're sitting on all the Z axis. So we can actually just pull this back negative five or just type in negative five. So we're cutting that 10 we added in half. And that's gonna make it even. And one quick little trick you can do if you wanted to move everything exactly number evenly but you're getting this multiple display which means that they're at different numbers say we wanted to take all these and for whatever reason move them up but move them all evenly up exactly five centimeters without having to do it visually 
What we can do is click in here and rather than just a number, because if we did it at like 50, it's gonna move them all up to the same point. We could type in X plus or minus a number. So let's say five, and that's gonna take whatever value they were individually at. And if I press enter and add a five to them. So it's a really useful little tip if we did X minus five or 10. Again, we could take multiple values and use some quick elementary school math and add it evenly. So there's your bonus little Cinema 4D tip that goes beyond just the basics that can help out in a lot of projects. So I'll just wanna do kind of the same things with the next set and keep using those values of 10 along them. So we have these blue pieces. So I'll go to object and we'll do this one at 80. So it'll be 10 more than the previous ones. And then coordinates, I'll go to negative 10. So now we have them stepping every five centimeters. And then with the eye, we only want that a little, so I'll do 85. And again, we could just tuck that in there, or if we wanna be really precise, I'll go to coordinates and we'll do negative 12.5. And we could just get that in there. So it's just slowing a little. So it's just showing a little. And now if I take a quick viewport render of this with Alt-R, we can see we get some nice definition. Everything is beveling out evenly and geometrically sound, and we were able to quickly do things. So if you sat through the 40-minute tutorial that I did a couple years ago on this, hopefully you learned how to do this in just a couple minutes in this one. So now that we have all this set up and we're dealing with different pieces, if we pull the camera in here, we might start to notice some little issues on some of these pieces, like here we have some overlap. And that's the one drawback to using that constraint setting where it pushes it in because we're not beveling it on the outside. So what we might want to do is take some of those smaller pieces, like these three blue pieces, go to caps and make those a bit smaller. So we'll do one radius and one radius. And if we're still getting that, which it looks like we are, for those smaller little details, we might want to check off constraint and just let those push out. So maybe they just push out just a little and are a bit smoother, so we still get that beveling, but we don't get those issues. And we also might wanna check out some of the other fillet types, because this is just this basic beveling, but we could also do things like a half circle, where it's getting this extra little bevel, one step and two step, as well as engraved, if we wanna kinda of push it in. And one thing we might notice as we're going through these is the geometry can look a little rough. And if the camera's far away, that's fine. But if it was really close in here, we don't want to see that bumpiness. And that's being handled at the vector line level of these. So if we popped open each of these, and if we wanted to grab only the original vector lines by command or control and clicking, that's being handled by this angle here. So if we drop that a bit more, we can see it's adding a lot of extra segments, but smoothing things out. So we might want to find a good middle ground where we're not doing too much, but smoothing that out, especially on some of these smaller details. And then I can just grab all those and close them so we can just focus on the extrude objects. Now, since we have the geometry on, you might notice that even though it looks mostly smooth, it's adding quite a bit of these little weird pinching segments. And it might look fine, but that could cause some issues. Like here we kind of see too much and we kind of have those same issues. And where that is pulling from, if we grab all these and take a look down here, what it's doing on the caps is rendering N-Gon, so it's not any specific shape. And if we wanted to fix that and give a little more control, we could change it to triangles. And you can see these smaller pieces, it kind of fixes that or quadrangles, and we could even do a regular grid, and that'll do the best it can to kind of work this out. So maybe I wanna take a look in here closer at some of these as we're customizing this, just to make sure if we're changing anything, we're not creating any issues, let's say if we made this smaller, and just make sure we have an idea of what's actually happening with our geometry, so if we know, so if we see any little issues, we can know how to fix that. And we might want to do something different with this eye. We can see that's getting really messed up because it's constraining it, but it's very small. So we don't want to take that one off constraint. 
and just make the radius a bit smaller. We'll do 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and maybe give that one a little more interesting look since it's kind of a focus. We could give that one maybe this two-step look and make sure it's sitting right below that engraved line. Again, keeping in mind, we don't want to break the original logo, but we want to do enough to make sure when we're building and adding 3D geometry, we're tucking things in where we want them. So after I take a quick look through this and make sure I don't have any geometry issues and I don't need to change any of these additional settings with it constraining or not constraining, if I want to get a quick idea of what this would look like with some default lighting and materials just to make sure it's all working, I'll turn off display lines real quick up here or press N and then A for this menu. So then we can kind of check and see what it looks like there. And I'll do Alt R for our render region box where I can get this little box and change our quality slider on the right if I want to. And what I want to do for this look is I'm going to go to my render settings and turn on effect ambient occlusion. And you can see how that's changing. We're going to get these little contact shadows and sub shadows where light would be blocked from an object by the object itself. So you can see in these little crevices, it's blocking whatever light would be coming in, which in this case is the default light and creating those additional little contact shadows or sub shadows where there's these little pockets that light wouldn't be reaching. And then to just get a default white material on this, I'm going to go down here to my materials and create new material or double click in this box. That's going to give us a base material. I can drop that on this whole hierarchy for now, and that's going to texture the whole object. And then I'll just open this up and not dive too much into materials right now, but just change this to a bright white. So we get kind of this default white clay look and I'll save this. And now over in after effects, we have that file and we can see our preview is going to show us that it's 1920 by 1080. And if we want to get this into a composition, all we have to do is drag this from our project into our new composition button. And that's going to open it up as a composition and save this and send it from cinema 40 to after effects based on the state of the file when you save that. So if I went back over to into cinema 40 light, make an adjustment with our default camera or anything else, save back in after effects, we can see that's updated and it's rendering that through this Cineware effect with this default software renderer. So we'll get into this in the next steps because you can do a lot with this, including change the renderer, even change it to an after effects camera if we wanted to and look at it that way, as well as send cameras, nulls, passes, and all sorts of stuff from Cinema 40 into After Effects, which is what we're building towards with each of these steps and getting this all working. So in the next part of this series, we'll get into texturing and lighting this to get some basic lighting, texturing, and shadow. So be sure to keep going if you want to learn more about that, as well as continue forward where we'll then get into animating this, compositing in After Effects, and linking a lot of stuff together. So check those additional ones out if you want to keep going with this, as well as be sure to check out some of my other Cinema 4D, Cinema 4D Lite, and After Effects tutorials if you want to learn more about this field, these tools, and all the new updates always coming out. And if you have a question about this, you can hit me up on Twitter. I'm at Sean Frangella. And be sure to subscribe to the YouTube page at youtube.com slash Sean Frangella to get new videos all the time about VFX and 3D animation. As always, thanks for watching. I will see you at the next video. Do you like watching these tutorials and want to see more episodes more often? You can help keep the show going by lending your support on Patreon at patreon.com slash Sean Frangella. More importantly, if you want to throw in a couple extra bucks, you can get bonus content like project files used in the tutorials, answers to direct questions, live hangouts for questions, and even request specific tutorial topics for me to use for my next video. Also be sure to subscribe to the show by clicking the subscribe button or visiting the show homepage at youtube.com slash Sean Frangella. And if you're hip with social media and have a question about this tutorial, you can find me on Twitter at Sean Frangella. As always, thanks for watching and I will see you at the next video.